This is Councilman Justin Brannon. It is a little after six o'clock on Thursday, June eighth, twenty twenty three. Tonight we want to we want to focus on the culturals and what does that mean and you know why are they so important? Why are our our arts and culture organizations, our museums, why are they all so important to the to the city of New York and to the people of New York and why do they deserve to have um, the funding that they need to succeed? New York City is one of the world's cultural capitals. Um, I would argue that it's the world's cultural capital. And people come to New York City from all over the world because of our cultural institutions, because of our museums and and Broadway and our performing arts and, and right down to the local arts and cultural organizations in the neighborhoods in the outer boroughs. And Really, a, a common theme that we heard through those countless hours of testimony was about the the role that the the role of of the cultural institutions and art and music play uh, in New York City and in New York City in the economy. And what does it mean for the economy? The jobs that come along with folks that work in this industry, and the tourism and and the tax dollars that that come and the exponential value of investing in our cultural institutions and what that means for the entire ecosystem that is uh, our economy. But it's also important that the same way that we're looking at our bigger cultural institutions and the ones that you imagine, you know, like the Museum of Modern Art or the Met or whatever it may, you know, American Natural History, whatever it may be, also our local cultural institutions and, and the folks that are really doing the work on the ground. Um, and, and that's what we want to we want to talk about tonight as well. Um and as we approach, um, you know, the next month of budget negotiations uh, with the mayor, you know, making sure and really getting our point across and why cultural institutions are so important to this council and why they're, <clears throat> excuse me, such a priority uh, for this council and why the council is going to fight hard to make sure that all these cultural institutions have the funding that they need, the support that they need to succeed, to thrive. It's personally important to me. I know it's personally important to our culturals chair, um, Chi Ose, and I want to introduce him now um, to talk a bit about the role of, of culture, the role that culture and arts play in New York City's community and why it's so important to this council. So, uh, Councilman Ose, Chair Ose, are you there? Do you want to chime in? Thank you so much, Councilmember Brannon, and good evening, everyone who is on this Twitter Spaces. Hope everyone is staying safe uh, and breathing some clean air within their apartments um, or in an indoor space if they have arrived there. Uh, I'm New York City Council Member Chi Ose and Chair of the Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations. And while it's always hard to follow up after Councilmember Brennan and sharing um, and advocating for how important um, our our culture sector here is in, here in, here in New York City is. Uh, New York City is the cultural capital, uh, not only of the United States of America, but I would argue uh, the world. Uh, people come here for our culture, uh, not only our larger. Uh, cultural institutions like the Met and MoMA, as the council member said, but also our local um, organizations that do uh, the groundwork and also provide uh, culture um, across every single community um, in the five boroughs of New York City. Um, of, co- of course, culture is is there to, to provide us with entertainment and joy um, and entertainment, um, you know, as we, we, we live in the city, but, um, it provides the city with a multitude of, of, of things, whether it's, uh, you know, adding to our, our economic output. The New York State Comptroller's Office, you know, conducted a study and, and found that the cultural sector in New York City, um, is a multi billion dollar, uh, sector. Uh, within within this state, and the fact that New York City um, invests under one percent of our 106 billion dollar budget into culture, um, yet it provides the output, uh, the economic output that it that it that it has, uh, just shows how impactful culture is not only uh, in our in our hearts, but um, within the wallets of of hundreds of thousands. Um, of New Yorkers. So uh, throughout this budget season, you know, the city council has been uh, filled with fierce advocates um, that have been pushing for a deeper investment um, into our, our cultural sector. Um, I'm hoping that we will we will uh, work on continuing to fight for, um, you know, a $50 million uh, 
uh, investment within culture as well as baselining within the culture budget. Um, I know that the culture sector is, is very thankful for um, the record investment that the, that the city council invested into culture last year. Uh, but there are so many cultural institutions and organizations uh, who are still struggling with, um, you know, audience levels who are still struggling to, to keep their doors open. Um, and we can do that with the budget that we have as big as we do here in the city of New York. Um, we have to do right by our cultural sector. So I'm um, happy to be on this call and, 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 and continuing this push and, and making sure that um, our cultural organizations and institutions uh, receive the funding that they deserve. Um, and I'm also so happy that I'm, I'm in a council, in a body of government, uh, where there are many folks who um, agree uh, with the amount of investment that is needed for our cultural sector. I guess I'll, I'll pass it Just back to Councilmember Brannon. Or Councilman Hudson. He may have gotten, he may have gotten uh, lost in the sauce <laughs> right. here in the Twitter spaces. Um, I guess I, I'll just introduce myself. Um, I'm Councilmember Crystal Hudson. I represent uh, many of the uh, amazing cultural institutions in Brooklyn, um, in my district, which includes the neighborhoods of Crown Heights, Prospect Heights, Fort Greene, Clinton Hill, and a sliver of Bed Stuy, neighboring. Um, council member Osei. So, um, you know, I think from my perspective, I'm also chair of the aging committee in the city council. And um, not only did I, you know, of course, like my colleagues grow up going to and learning from and picking up um, hobbies from a lot of these different cultural institutions. But when I was a caregiver for my mother who had Alzheimer's disease, um, I also took her to many of these these cultural institutions that have programming specifically for people with Alzheimer's and dementia um, and brain injuries, um, which most people probably don't know. Um, there's an amazing program called Connect to Culture that is at many of the cultural institutions across the city, um, everything from Lincoln Center to the Brooklyn Museum to the Brooklyn Botanic Garden um, to the Met um, and everything in between. And so we know you know, the, the real value of these cultural institutions goes so much further than just simply um, the art and the culture that they're known for, but for the local um, programming, um, the services that they provide to so many of our neighbors of all ages. Um, and so I just wanted to, to mention that and share that because I think um, sometimes we don't realize how much our cultural institutions actually do um, that they do so much more than just putting on the, the sort of traditional, um, you know, exhibits and, and presentations. But a lot of them have amazing uh, programs that dip into so many different areas. I'll leave it there. I think Council Member Brandon is back. Maybe not. Well, Crystal, I guess we can move ahead to your special singing performance that you prepared for tonight. Oh, I thought we were going to yours first. Oh, Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> perhaps, perhaps a, a duet. Yeah, we could, we could, we can duet for sure. Um, I guess I can, I can continue and, uh, you know, and talking about culture until uh, Councilmember Brennan uh, returns. Is that is that you, Councilmember? Um, I, I also do want to shout out solo, solo. Oh, there we go, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> let me in, let me in. <laughs> All right, I'm back. She she was about to get, she was about to start his solo performance. Oh my God. That's do they need me on here. All right. So let <laughs> you came in the nick of time. I think we, I, it was saved by the bell. I think we're going to talk to the advocates now. Correct. Let's do that. Um, I want to, um, I want to bring in um, some of the advocates who um, are really on the ground and, and doing a lot of great and, and meaningful and important work and can talk a little bit about um you know, their groups and, and what this funding really means sort of exponentially for the city of New York and why um, it's so important that we make sure uh, that our local our local groups and not just the big guys um, get the support and the funding they need. And um, really coming out of COVID, um, you know, I, I think we've seen the importance of uh, arts and culture and, and why it's so important to make sure that 
we expand access so that art and culture and music, and it's not just for fancy people. It's not just for rich people in museums and buying paintings. It, our arts and culture is really for everybody. And it's about breaking down those barriers. Um, and I think all of us, I mean, me and, and, and council members Osei and council member Hudson, I think we all, sh all share those same values in that you know, we want to expand access so that everyone can appreciate all of the arts and culture that New York City has to offer um, and that it's not just for, uh, you know, people that, that have access to it. And that's why it's important that we're, you know, fighting to get expanded money for uh, arts and culture education in public schools. Uh, and, and I think that's why we're overall we're fighting to, to make sure that arts and culture is not seen as extra so that it's seen as essential, that it's essential to the city. It's essential to the development of, of kids and early childhood education. And it's, it's so much of the vibrant fabric of New York city um, a, 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 that it cannot be, be seen as extra or something that can just be, um, you know, added on. If we've got the money, it needs to be essential. It needs to be part of, of, uh, really the crux of, of everything we do. So I'd like to um, invite Lucy Sexton, who's the executive director for New Yorkers for Culture and Arts, to uh, talk a little bit about her organization and uh, why this space is, is so important. Lucy, you there? Thanks so much. I'm very, very happy to be here. New Yorkers for Culture and Arts is a coalition. It includes individual artists, culture workers, small organizations, large institutions across the five boroughs of New York City. And I really was drawn both by uh, what Council Member Hudson was saying about um, how it affected her mom when she was struggling with Alzheimer's and also what you were talking about, you know, it being for everyone and it, it being so important, um, you know, in education to kids, et cetera. We know the city is struggling with mental health problems. We know our students are struggling with mental health problems. And I will just tell one story. The cultural groups in, that we work with, you know, they are engaged with the, the students. They, they have what's called through the council CASA programs, creative after school adventures, and they work also directly with the DOE in the schools. Well, Queens World Film Festival uh, was doing a program with fifth graders in a public school in Queens. And they had a boy who was a selective mute and they did a whole you know, series and he engaged in the film and he got involved in it. And when it came time to show the film, he got up on stage, he picked up the microphone and started talking about how great it was to finally engage and connect with his uh, fellow classmates. The principal burst into tears. She said in five years, she had never heard him speak. So when we say that culture really impacts kids' mental health, people's mental health, the mental health of our elders, it is real, it is effective, it is, provides an avenue for kids to express themselves, to connect with each other, to connect with community. So it is critical to so many of the things that are facing the city right now. I'm gonna swing to the other end of it, which is uh, Council Member Brown, and you talked about the economy. You know, We know that the city is facing so many critical issues that it needs to fund and spend money on. And what I have to say about arts and culture is that we actually, generate revenue, right? We bring $54 billion in tourism dollars to the city every year. Of those $54 billion, the New York State Comptroller de Napoli's report said that 12% of it went to arts and entertainment, 88% of it went to restaurants and retail and hotels and local transportation. So people come for the culture, they spend money across the city. And in individual, you know, when you go right down to the small uh, neighborhood. What brings people out into the street? They're going to come out and see a show, and then they're going to go across the street and stop and have something to eat in the restaurant. Maybe they'll stop down the street and get a, uh, something on the deli on the way home. So we generate the local economy. We generate the, the massive economy. We bring in a hundred, we generate $110 billion in economic activity through the creative economy. So we're a major driver. So we should not be seen as something that's like, oh, it's another draw on it. No, we are actually going to be part of what's going to keep people living in New York, keep our tax base here, keep people visiting New York, and actually lead us back into a thriving, vibrant future for this city. So um, I'll stop it there, but uh, thanks so much. Thanks, Lucy. Could you could you talk a little bit about in the council's um, response, we called for, and, and council member Ose mentioned as well, we called for $50 million to support uh, cultural uh, 
institution groups and the cultural development fund recipients, a significant part um, of which would be baselined. Could you talk about how that funding would support the budgets of organizations like yours and organizations citywide? Sure. Uh, You know, for those who aren't familiar with, you know, budget speak, what we talked about the baseline is how much is in the, you know, every year goes in and says that's the baseline funding for the Department of Cultural Affairs, right? And then every year the council looks and and they say, well, we're going to add a little bit more to that when we adopt the budget. The truth is the baseline funding for the Department of Cultural Affairs hasn't been increased in 10 years. This means that the, the sector is constantly waiting to hear how much will the council give us this year? Can I hire that extra teaching artist? Do I have to lay off that extra teaching artist? I'll give you one exact example. Um, you know, we have we're talking about hip hop and, you know, we didn't I, I don't think we ever invested enough in, you know, the, the dance studios and music studios that that would create the next generation of hip hop artists in this city. Rockefeller, who is one of the lead uh, hip hop dancers, uh, leaders and, and activists. And she started a program a few years ago working with Gibney Dance to actually get street choreographers, people who engage in street dance, to come in and learn about, you know, stage technology and projections and lighting design so that they could start to choreograph for the stage as well as for the street and the subway. That program existed and then it went away. And now she's struggling to go and get more money for it. So when you baseline, it means that, yes, this is a good program. We want it to develop the workforce. We want to invest in it. We want to know that it's going to be there for many years and not have to struggle every year to find out if it has funding. Right. So for those listening at home, just a little uh, lingo check. What baselining means is that when you baseline something in the budget, that means that every year that money is going to be there. So a lot of what we have to fight for every year, unfortunately, in the council um, is what we call one shots. And a one shot means we fight to get that money just for that budget. And then we have to start that fight and that campaign all over again the following year for the next budget. So baselining is really the holy grail uh, for, for us in the city council for things that really matter. Because um, for one shots, it's for some things, maybe it works for things that that are, are currently um, you know, a crisis or something that we're currently dealing with in the city that maybe hopefully is not a temporary concern. But for something like arts and culture, um, it's something that's going to be important every year. So having to fight for those one shots over and over and over again and having to, you know, organize and campaign for what we know should be baselined and, and built into the budget every year um, is really what we fight for. So when you hear people tonight talking about baselining, um, that that's what they're they're talking about. So um, I want to call in now uh, Talia Corin, who is the co-executive, co-executive director for Art New York, Art NY, um, to talk a little bit uh, about their organization um, and uh, maybe talk a little bit about what would happen to the, the, the cultural sector in this budget um, if it didn't include this level of funding or if we didn't see it baselined. Talia, you there? I believe we're missing her. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Is uh, Nikisha Hamilton there? Yes. Hi. Hey, Nikisha. Um, Nikisha Hamilton is the executive director and the founder of Afeni Studios uh, and member of the Museum of Contemporary African uh, Diaspora Arts. Um, do you want to? Do you want to chime in on that? Talk, but first, talk about your organization. But tell us what would happen uh, if we didn't get this funding this year. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me on. My name is Nikisha Hamilton, and our organization, um, my business is called Fanny Creative Studios, and we are a cultural advocacy organization that really actually focuses mostly on Black culture and ways that we can preserve and develop Black culture. And so for me, I started Fanny Creative Studios after working with Lucy um, and a bunch of others on the Culture at Three call as I was the the chair of the data working group. And after I saw, I basically had a privilege and um, an honor to see numbers from the Met to Arts East New York and seeing the the, in, the inequity and what happens and, and, and actually the, the need that these organizations budget have 
on the city, on on the city government, especially because city council and just local level actually gives the most amount of money to a lot of these organizations. And that's not saying a lot, right? Because we're fighting for baseline funding. And so understanding the dependency and then also understanding the importance that Black culture is for me and making sure that these organizations are whole. I create a Fanny Creative Studios to help organizations of color um, go through the budget process, understand it, how to engage government and whatnot. So working with these organizations, um, they need this funding. If they don't have this funding, they face closure. They face, um, as uh, Lucy highlighted earlier, the um, programs being um, ended. Um, actually, kids feeling disenfranchised, young people, people in the community feeling disenfr- further disenfranchised because what my culture, my organization was not worthy of investment. And so that, for me, like to answer your question more directly, um, Council Member Brandon, um, when we don't have the baseline funding. That means that organizations are susceptible to closure, to ending programs, and to, you know, discontinue whatever services that they provide the community. I think that um, a lot of people see arts and culture as just a tourism thing. Arts and culture is not a tourism thing. Arts and culture helps um, serve under, is largely, most of them are in underserved communities and they serve these communities and creative colors to utilize arts and culture to foster identity, social cohesion, cultural preservation, public health, and most importantly, public safety. I live in the hood. I don't know how much of y'all live in the hood, but a lot of people need these programs and these support so that they're not on, out on the streets facing danger and trouble. So the moment that our organization closed, guess what? More kids have nothing to do. More people have nothing to do. And so we have, it's it's a quality of life issue. It's a public health issue when you don't support arts and culture. So I'll stop there because, you know, I can, I can go. <laughs> we appreciate that. Um, okay. Let's, I want to go back to Lucy for a second. Um, could you talk about the, the state, you know, everyone wants COVID to be over and, and further in the rear view mirror than unfortunately it actually is. Could you talk a little bit about the state of culturals right now, given the pandemic and, and how things have changed? Yeah, I mean, uh, culture was the first to close, right? We we gather people together so that we were one of the first sectors that the city said, no, you got to shut down the museums, the theaters, et cetera. We were also the last to reopen. And we knew because exactly that, because we gather people together, we knew that recovering from this was going to be a ramp. It was going to take us a while to to bring ourselves up out of this. Well, we are still on that ramp. And the relief that was coming from the federal relief and from different sources has ended. So a lot of cultural organizations right now are looking at falling off a cliff. The uh, we are not up to uh, the levels of earned income and donated income that we had in 2019. So. We are out there doing our work. We are putting on shows. We are putting on street festivals and Celebrate Brooklyn is about to open and do music in Prospect Park. So we're there and we are revitalizing the city, but we are doing it at a deficit. We still have not recouped the money that we lost and we are still not up to where we should be uh, in terms of uh, next year's uh, budget that we're working on. We're looking at budgeting deficits. So this is really a critical time. And the city has faced critical, you know, hard financial times before, and we're asking them to do something different. You invest in culture, just like Nikisha was saying, you invest in an organization, you know, Arts East New York closed during the pandemic, right? That means that neighbors and and families in, in East New York don't have a place to send their kid to dance class or to go down and see some music. So that means that that neighborhood is is further behind. So we're asking the city to invest in arts and culture. It is a modest amount of money. What it does is it makes the neighborhood safer, gives people activities like Nikisha was saying, but it also gives us a reason to live in New York, right? We're working from home now. We can live anywhere. We want to live somewhere where we can send our kids to really good music classes down the street, where we can go see a show at night, where we can go see to the museum or the garden uh, or the zoos on the weekends. That's the reason we are here. So I just think that it's it's a really, really tricky time. We are not recovered and we need 
uh, the in increased investment from the city in order to maintain this in the neighborhoods and for the city at large. Um, council member? Yeah, Nikisha, you want to chime in there? Yeah, I just wanted to hop in with Lucy, um, kind of piggyback off of what Lucy's saying. Um, basically, we've been operating in a deficit since forever. Um, and our funding levels in the 70s from the federal level all the way down to state local level, it was much higher than it is currently. So in some aspects, it's like we're working backwards because we used to have arts education in the school. We used to have funding for that. We used to have funding through actually and, and the, the crime bill in 1994 on the federal level. They had money allocated to arts. So in order to do public safety, even though that crime bill is controversial, even then they had some sort of understanding how arts and culture is critical to supporting public safety and to supporting the quality of life. Um, you know, for me personally, I'm tired of making artists out of struggle. We want to water these people so that they can flourish. And so the fact that we, we, we are fighting for baseline funding, which um, for the arts and culture sector where, you know, as many of the council members have identified on this, on this call, that we are the cultural capital of, of the world. However, we do not make even um, the same levels of, uh, of the city of Paris does. And so that is something that is key to understand. And like <clears throat> the great late John Wright said, arts and culture is one of the few things one of the only public safety tool, public health tools that you can invest in and see a return out of. And so when you're investing into arts and culture, you know, we're trying to mitigate so many different crises, but there's cultural organizations like Mokata that has an urban farm that's developing almost 300 pounds of food every six weeks that can be given out to the community. There's been organizations like Brooklyn Museum, like WCS and, and so many others that became OPE, um, the OPE center and also was giving food to the community, even when we're closed down. And on top of that, managing a virtual world with no money and fear of, of, of the fact that we may not have money. Arts and culture has been developing through a scarcity mindset and it shouldn't have to, but it does. And the community develop the community depends upon it. So for me, when we even talk about baseline funding and talk about equitable distribution, you know, we're always often struggling because why? Folks, we're we're struggling because folks are like, hey, why is this person getting this money? Why is that person getting this money? So then we create tension in our own field when we're all just trying to feed our community. So it's not only about, okay, yes, we're, we, we need the funding to, for general operating funds and for um, op, like just programs and whatnot. It's about quality of life in our community, quality of life for our staff. It's about being that place that um, continues to, to, to amplify New York City's soft power and in that America's soft power. Because soft power is how we are able to be known all around the world. And New York City is the reason, part of the reason that is. So that when we're talking about baseline funding, when we're talking about that investment, we're investing in soft power, public safety, a plethora of things that I just highlighted. That's, I mean, you, you touched on a lot of great points, Nikisha. And I, I don't know that there is another space other than arts and culture and music that um, the, the, the exponential value of investing, um, it touches so many, so many, I mean, it's, it's mental health. It's, it's building community. It's, it's the economy, it's jobs, it's tourism. Um, you know, it, it's, it, it, it's early childhood education. It's, it's expanding people's horizons. It's giving access to folks who, um, may feel that, you know, arts and culture are, are sort of, beyond their reach for whatever reason. It's breaking down those barriers. I think it's important to really, um, you know, to really emphasize that, that I think, unfortunately, um, you know, we're, we're still battling with folks who feel that the arts and culture are um, extra. And I think it's, it's super important to always bring it back to 
um, you know, you know, you know, back to the, the, the true value of investing in, in arts and culture. Um, council member Osei or council member Hudson, do you want to chime in on that? Yeah. I mean, every single point that Lucy and Nikisha noted is, is facts and truth, right? There was a study done that I always reference last year at the university of Pennsylvania, uh, where they saw a direct correlation in an investment in cultural organizations and, and institutions and a decline in crime and especially violent crime, uh, within, um, some of the more rougher areas of, of Philly. And, um, you know, we know that, uh, this is something that we are c- consistently say and speak about, um, as advocates for the culture, cultural community. And not only, again, is it uh, something that that adds to our economy, but it is uh, public safety, it's mental health care, it's child care, it's education. Um, You know, I do see Arts and Education Roundtable on this call as well, um, which is a you know, great organization that is advocating for there to be arts in all of our our New York City schools. But, um, you know, the, the drop of investment uh, that we put into culture just adds to to so much within our city as a whole. Um, and I just do want to uplift uh, a lot of the sentiments and, and facts, again, that, that Lucy and Nikisha brought up on this call. If I could go Member on. Hudson? Let us let Chrissy want to jump in. I, yeah, um, thanks. I was, I was going to say essentially the same thing that um, Council Member Osei said, which is just that arts is so much more than just that, you know, and I think that's what you've heard everybody say so far is, um, you know, and I don't want to repeat exactly what Council Member Osei said, but it's our, it's our mental health and wellness. Um, it is like the very fabric of the communities in which we all live. It's what brings us um, so many of us here to New York and to specific neighborhoods. Um, and, you know, it's for younger people and older people um, and all different types of people and people who speak different languages and people who come from different places. And so I think it's understanding and realizing as far as the budget is concerned, um, what the arts and culture um, sector has been through over the last few years. And as Lucy said, they were the first to close, the last to open they're still reeling from everything that's been going on. People don't have as much disposable income um, to give to arts organizations or to spend on performances, live performances and shows and such. Um, And so whatever we can do in the city council, and I know we're all fighting um, hard to ensure that our cultural institutions are funded, um, but whatever we can do as government to ensure that these gems uh, continue to thrive and aren't struggling year after year um, to give us all of the the joy that they give us. Um, you know, I, I just want to impress upon folks that, um, you know, the council gets it. And that's exactly why we're having this Twitter spaces conversation tonight. Absolutely, Chris. I mean, I think what we're really trying to get out here is that while some people might think that that arts and culture is sort of you know, the dessert, it's, 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 it's superfluous in some ways. It's the opposite, right? It's actually the the, the whole damn meal. Um, it's actually the most important thing. And it, and it touches so many, um, you, you know, so many areas that are so important to so many New Yorkers. And I think it'd be interesting to hear a little bit from um, Nikisha and Lucy about, you know, the, the, eco- the, the economic impact of cultural organizations and supporting um, asylum seekers. So obviously, you know, we spoke about you know, how strong levels of tourism are, are absolutely crucial to New York City's economy and our recovery. Um, so how do arts and cultural organizations attract tourists to their events? And 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 how does that all lead to the, the compounding economic benefits and, and job growth for our city? And then also, if there are ways that cultural organizations have shown up for local communities in moments of crisis before, as they are now, um, as as the city struggles to support uh, tens of thousands of people seeking asylum, could you talk a little bit about that? A little bit about you know the meaningful impact um, that that some of these organizations have had there. It's Lucy Sexton here from New Yorkers for Culture and Arts. I will jump in. Um, you know, uh, it's been said many times, we know, you know, uh, arts and culture, so much of arts and culture comes from immigrants, right? Whether we're talking the Gershwins, whether we're talking, you know, Afro-Latin jazz, so much of it comes from it. 
What has to happen, though, first is we have to make sure that newly arrived immigrants are safe and sane and feel, uh, you know, connected. And what can connect you? What connects you to community? The music that you're familiar with, getting to a drum circle, doing some dance that you are connected with. I know that um, some of the schools right here in, in, in downtown Manhattan are filled with um, newly arrived Venezuelan immigrants. And so they don't speak the language and all of a sudden the school is overwhelmed. But what they do understand is connecting with dance and playing some music. And that is that, first of all, getting those kids engaged in school. So it is, you know, when when uh, Arts and Education Roundtable talks about the, uh, you know, a connected ecosystem, you have cultural groups that provide these services, provide culturally appropriate services into schools who have whatever population. And at this point, it is a lot of newly arrived immigrants. You're also seeing mental health struggles among people who are living long term in shelter and newly arrived, and they've been through a lot of trauma. So again, being able to go to the Clemente Center in the Lower East Side and connect with an all day festival of a culture that you can connect with and understand and then meet people and meet people in that community and then be connected and be integrated into our city. So, you know, I, I have said before, you know, housing and, and, and feeding people is so important and culture is what makes a place home. Culture is what makes community. So this is also critical services that need to be provided and that we can do and we can help the city. We realize the city is struggling with this, but culture has a role to play. Cultural centers, cultural groups in schools, in centers in uh, different neighborhoods uh, really make a difference. And, you know, we talked and I, I, I loved you talking about all the different areas that we intersect with. You know, I like to talk about community safety. There's, you know, Mind Builders is an art center up in the Bronx and they run a dance program and Saturday night they get, gather teens. So Saturday night they have teenagers coming to learn hip hop dance moves, to show off to each other, to do battles. And guess what? Those kids are also now getting agents. So it's not only providing a safe space for the teenagers in one of the lowest wealth communities in the Bronx and one of the, that was hardest hit by COVID. So those kids are also traumatized. It's giving them a place of joy, a place of to master their skill and a place to enter the creative economy by getting an agent and maybe being able to work in uh, the creative sector in New York City, which does so much. Um, I want to also talk about, you know, in one of those you, you referred to the UPenn study, uh, Council Member Osei, and, you know, it, it even improves aging outcomes. And I uh, worked in a senior center in Chinatown teaching dance there, and, and we would do different games. And I had one game where I asked people, you know, when were they the happiest in their life? And to talk about that and to make a story. And this older gentleman started crying and he said, you know, I have been working in factories since I was 14. In this class today, in this senior center is when I have been the happiest in my life because I'm enjoying myself, I'm connecting with people, I'm doing something besides working in a factory. And believe me, that ch uh, senior center uh, in Chinatown, it's an amazing, the open door center, and those people live past 100 because they are connected, they're enjoying themselves, they're singing together, they're dancing together. So um, what my last, last thing I just wanna say is, which uh, Nikisha touched on earlier, which is that we have to look at all of New York City, right? Um, we have to look at, at, at Brownsville and East New York and Mott Haven and uh, Staten Island and every neighborhood. Every neighborhood can benefit from the power of culture and arts. And to do that, it's going to take a bigger pie. We don't have enough in the budget now. We should really be working towards spending 1% of the city budget on culture to really fully fund culture in every community. And then we have the picture of the that we want to show the world, right? That, that we always do when we're saying New York, New York tourism. We're putting out these pictures of people playing music and dancing and being in the street and going to the theater. This is what we want for every community in New York City. And it's time to make that investment. And it's not a big investment and it pays off many times over. I, I would love to hop in on this. Um, so... One of the things I love most about me is that I'm first generation New Yorker. Um, my my father's from Jamaica and my mother's from Trinidad and Tobago. And um, I was born right here and raised in Crown Heights and then I moved to Flatbush. But my parents met right here in Crown Heights because it's largely a Caribbean neighborhood. Central Brooklyn is largely a Caribbean or was a Caribbean neighborhood um, center. And actually, 
po- possibly the capital of the Caribbean diaspora. New York City is the capital of the Black di- African diaspora. And so when my parents from two different countries were able to come here and meet, and create a life here because of cultural institutions like Sesame Flyers, like Wiatka, like Ifatayo, like all these different, Kadi, all these different organizations that have cultivated, like Lucy highlighted, a home for these people because they have come here because of various, because of economic reason, for economic opportunity and a better life to raise a family. And so even now, as we welcome new New Yorkers, like Lucy's saying, these migrants that are coming in, you know, they're coming in and they're going to go to any organization that speaks to them, any neighborhood that speaks to them and the organizations that are home in those spaces that keep the culture and preserve it and develop it to make sure that New York City is seen as a place that is home and that anybody can be here and make it for better, for, for, for whatever reason that could be. And so when we're talking about, um, when we talk about even largely economic generator, we're talking about immigrant groups who have to- thrown, and I'm going to say specifically, the West Indian Carnival. We have organizations that, like Sesame Flyers, that do programs in schools. I'm a child of Sesame Flyers. I did Saturday programs. I went to predominantly white schools all my life. I went to PS221. I went to Trevor Day School. You went I, to PS221? You know, but- yes, did I did. we talk about that already? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> and Lucy's in the club. Really? Oh, love. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And so for, for me to be able to participate in programs and play steel pan and to dance, um, Caribbean dance, it, 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 it helped me develop into the person I am to be strong in who I am as a first generation child. And imagine that feeling for a migrant, an immigrant. And a person who has to raise their children here who came, like immigrant families are coming here every day in New York City. And so in that sense, they have come here, they made a home here, and they make money. Because New York City, the carnival, the West Indian Day Carnival, um, uh, um, West Indian American Day Carnival Parade on Labor Day used to generate $300 million a weekend in four days for New York City. Carnival or from the Caribbean to Latin America alone is a $125 billion industry. And because New York City is not investing in that, oh, more close to home, New Orleans makes a billion, $1 billion off of Carnival. Our our community, our organizations like Sesame, like Wiatka, like um, Juve City, they make, they were, they were able to help and a bunch of other bands were able to help make New York City in four days $300 million with New York City giving an investment of less than 1% of the budget. So imagine if New York City was able to invest more. So not only immigrants come here, not only these com- organizations make a community and push forward even when they had a lack of investment, Sesame Flyers, they had a lack of investment, they help put 15 bands on the road for Carnival, just because they know how important it is to micro entrepreneurs, to small businesses in the community, to um, the MTA, to to New New Jersey, New York Transit, whatever it is. Sesame Flies and other bands understood how important it is for their representation to be here, even if they didn't get the amount of investment that they deserved and equitable investment, investment that they deserve. But they keep on making money. So how, what kind of relationship are we having? Are we having a generative relationship or are, are we having an exploitive relationship if we're not investing in, in, in culture? That's, I mean, you, you really nailed it there, um, Nikisha. I mean, I think, it, you know, art and, and culture are really what makes a place a home. And I think, you know, if, if the beauty of the world lies in the diversity of its people, then having that um, familiarity with, you know, you know, recognizing, um, you know, recognizing your culture and recognizing that it, it, it what it, it's what makes people belong, and it's what makes people feel like they they finally arrived someplace where where they belong. And I think that's where really 
um, you, you know, the beauty is, um, not to get too, uh, too, too philosophical on it. Um, Council Member Hudson, do you want to chime in a little bit about, about arts and culture as it relates to folks who, who are coming here looking for a better life? Sure. I think, you know, this is what everybody has already said, which is that arts and culture is quite literally for everyone. Um, people come here with their own culture, their own um, you know, practices, their own gifts and talents. And then we create opportunities for people to showcase that. I think our arts and culture scene is as vibrant as it is here in New York City because it includes people from all over the world um, and, you know, who, who bring their own flavor. Chi, you want to jump in? I'm just speechless by... Uh, Nikisha and Lucy and all of the advocacy on this on this call, but um, I think everything that was said or that needed to be said was said this evening. Right on. Well, I think we'll we'll wrap it up there. Lucy, Nikisha, thank you so much. Thanks for all that you do. Thank you for your advocacy. Um, look, you have allies in this council. You have folks who. Um, really live and, and, and breathe this stuff. And, and this is important to us. This was important to us before we were elected officials and it's going to be important to us after, but it's certainly important to us now. Um, and, and, you know, thinking Council about, Brandon? yes, go ahead, Luce. Sorry, Lucy. here. I just was just going to say, you know, we have the Tonys coming up this weekend. I just want to leave everyone with, with one last thought, which is that no fewer than nine shows on Broadway were developed in our nonprofit theater system, right? From National Black Theater, from the public, um, you know, from small organizations. You must fund the nonprofit system in order to feed Broadway, which generates so much money. And especially if you want those Broadway jobs going to New York artists. So very proud of it. Very, very happy to be involved in this conversation. Very, very grateful for your support in the council. And uh, God willing, we'll, uh, we'll see see some investment in culture in, in the budget. But thanks so much. That was well said. And, and Councilmember Brandon, if I could just jump in too, and just to piggyback off of what Lisa sure. just said, make a small little plug for also those, those small organizations and nonprofits like Urban Glass, which is in my district. If anyone has seen or heard of the reality show Blown Away, um, that's... You know, so many of the artists featured on that show started and are still artists at Urban Glass. And so, like Lucy said, everything starts right here. And we need to make sure that these organizations, particularly the smaller ones, have the deep investments that they deserve. Thank you, Councilmember Hudson. Hey, I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight, especially Lucy and Nikisha. For, for having this conversation with us and the city council is going to be fighting for our arts and culture organizations, completely understanding the economic impact of cultural organizations, the emotional impact um, and, and, and how important they are to the vitality and, and really what makes New York city, New York city. So I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight on Thursday night. Um, and we look forward to talking with you all again soon, signing off from the right side of City Hall. Uh, this is Council Member Justin Brennan. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Take care, everyone. <laughs>